Over the years as an educational therapist, I have become fascinated with the way our brain processes information. Whatever else is out there in this universe, it is our brain that we use as the vehicle to connect our inner self with everything else. There's a video currently going around available on YouTube. It's Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. She's a well-known neuroscientist who had a bleeding stroke in the left side of her brain. She talks about her experience of having the stroke and her recovery. And one of her first thoughts was, wow, this is so cool. How many brain scientists get to study their brain from the inside out? It shut down her left brain, her sequential logical language brain, and she found herself experiencing a profoundly expansive and enlightened right brain that she affectionately called her La La Land. Now, even though she's recovered from her stroke, she remains very much changed by this experience. Her conclusion after her experience is that we are all connected as one human family. And we forget that when we start to function in our sequential language left center, which says, I am, and makes it separate from the others. So what brings human beings to perform acts of kindness and generosity and even acts of heroism? Brain science and what we've learned from interviewing heroes and altruists leads us to the notion that when we become aware of our connectedness, then we feel compelled to help. First, let's look at some brain science. Now, we used to believe that when you were born, you had all the brain cells you were ever going to have, and that by about the age of 12, all the connections were going to be pretty much hardwired and insulated, and, and things were really set. Well, in the last 10, 15 years, we've discovered that we continue to make brain cells. This is incredible. Stem cells in the brain and the spinal cord turn into thousands of new neurons, brain cells, every day. And these new neurons travel to targeted locations wherever they're supposed to go. And there they make, over the next four months, about 10,000 connections. 10,000 connections. So what we know now is that we can change our brain. And we do so every day by what we experience and by what we tell ourselves. We change our brains whether or not we intend to or not. We can do this consciously or we can let the world wash over us and make those changes. Our brains are actually a conglomerate of a number of multiple systems that process different kinds of information. In some ways, we could say we have two different ways of thinking, two primary ways. We have a rational thinking brain, and then we have an emotional instinctive brain, which we call the amygdala. And this brain comes into play when we experience strong emotions, the emotions of joy, the fear, disgust, excitement, the amygdala takes over in emergencies or in highly charged situations, and it bypasses the rational thinking brain through what we call a back alley connection, a shortcut that just slips by the thinking brain. Information in the amygdala le leads directly to action, like somebody grabbing a child who is about to rush in front of a car. This part of the brain may be in play during these spontaneous acts of heroism we see um, driven by emergency situations. And often you will hear the hero saying, I just did it. I didn't think about it. It just happened. We also have some neurochemicals that help us with our connectedness. Oxytocin circulates in our system, and this neurochemical encourages bonding and caregiving. It's enhanced by touch. It often also acts through that back pathway, the amygdala, to create feelings of attachment and nurturing, feelings of caregiving, and even feelings of lust. The parental protectiveness that comes on when we have a child, a newborn, is the result of oxytocin surging through the body. And then we have perhaps one of the most fascinating recent discoveries, the discovery of mirror cells. Did you ever wonder why a yawn from one person spreads throughout the whole group? Or did you ever have the sense that you knew what somebody was going to say or do before they did it? Why is meditating or chanting in a group more powerful often than doing the same thing alone? Did you ever sit in church or worse, at a funeral when somebody started to giggle and no matter what you could do, you couldn't resist giggling too? This is more than just the power of suggestion. But we didn't know how much until an accidental discovery in 1992. 
Italian scientists were mapping the brains of some monkeys. And they did this with laser-thin wires, and each wire could be connected into a single brain cell to notice when that brain cell fired. And when the brain cell would fire, there was a monitor, and it would make a sound. It'd go brr, 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 when there was activity in the brain cell. So every time the monkey would reach out and grasp an object, some of the cells that they have wired up would fire on the monitor and make the brr sound. One day, one of the researchers came back from lunch, and he was eating an ice cream cone. And as he raised the ice cream cone to his lips, he heard the monitor go off. Brr, brr. The cells that the monkey used to reach out and grasp something were firing. These are the same cells as though that monkey were actually picking up an ice cream cone and licking it. So the monkey had not moved, and yet his brain cells fired as though he had. All he saw was that student eating the ice cream cone, moving it to his mouth. But his motor cells in his brain were copying the movements, causing the monitor to chirp. And this event led to the discovery of mirror cells in the monkey's brain, special cells that fire when the animal sees or hears an action, and the same ones that would fire if the monkey actually did the action. We humans turn out to have mirror cells also. We have multiple systems of mirror cells. They're very complex. And they specialize in not only in understanding the actions of others, we have cells in our brain that help us understand other people's emotions and intentions. This is not psychic. This is wired into our biological system. And that's, you know, it's been the researcher, the, who, the Italian researcher was Dr. Vizzolatti. And he said, here's, here's a quote from him, he said, Our survival depends on understanding the actions, intentions, and emotions of others. Mirror neurons allow us to grasp the minds of others, not through conceptual reasoning, not through thinking, but through direct simulation by feeling in our own body. By feeling, not thinking about it. So when we see somebody perform an action, such as picking up a baseball, inside our own body there are mirror cells that simulate that action. We have brain, circuits in our brain that, that keep us from actually acting that way so that they inhibit the movement. Kind of like when we're dreaming about running, we don't actually get up and run. That's, that movement is inhibited. So, but there is something going on in our own body that mimics or mirrors what this other person is doing. This way, we have a template inside for what this other person is doing. And they've even shown with the research that we can understand someone's intentions. For instance, if someone reaches out to take a glass from a table, the observer can tell whether that person intends to pick that glass up and drink from it or to take that glass and clear it from the table. We have a biological system that senses other people's intentions. Now, these mirror neurons are what many people consider to be a very important contributor to empathy. It's the I feel your pain kind of empathy, not no, let me think about what happened to you, but a, a ten tendency to share to some extent what someone else feels. Daniel Stern at the University of Geneva says that our nervous systems are constructed to be captured by the nervous systems of others. Whether we want to be or not, we are affected by other people. So we can experience others as if from in their own skin. He says we resonate with their experience, and they resonate with ours. He says we can no longer see our minds as so independent, separate, and isolated, but we must view our minds as permeable, continually interacting as though joined by an invisible link with others around us. We are in constant, unconscious dialogue with anyone we interact with. Now, Daniel Goleman, the author of Emotional Intelligence and Social Intelligence, two companion books on the, the brain and how they, we interact, he says we're wired to understand the feelings and the intentions of others and to have an inner experience that mirrors what we see others doing. He calls it human Wi-Fi. But being able to know what others are feeling and intending isn't all that we need in order to experience kindness or, or to want to perform acts of kindness. And it's chilling to know that sociopaths and torturers are highly skillful at reading others, but that they choose to use that skill 
for a less than compassionate purpose.